Hello everybody, Nico Alexopoulos from Soccer Skills and today's video is uh, called Youth Soccer Coaches Make These Common Mistakes, Learn How to Avoid Them and Elevate the Team's Play. So um, before we get uh, started, we're going to just uh, dive in uh, with um, a quick segment about continuous uh, uh, learning coaching education okay and unfortunately this is something that uh, for the majority of the youth coaches especially the volunteer coaches um, is quite missed so let's get started we say be a student of the game and share the knowledge the next uh, three things are elements that I think are missing from the US youth soccer coaching landscape and these are the things that lead into common mistakes by the youth soccer coaches so first of all there is no continuous coach education um, at the very least you know volunteer parent coaches may get their introductory certification of coaching and that's about it um, they don't go into any seminars workshops they don't obtain any cer certifications uh, they learn what they learn uh, in that initial you know uh, licensing and that's about it uh, the sports scene and especially soccer is is changing by you know the month the um, the year so there's a lot of things that you know are constantly evolving and, and we need to update ourselves like anything else so not having a continuous coaching education system in place where, you know, volunteer coaches can learn a little bit more every day. And, you know, I understand that this is not your, your job. You're just volunteering. But that's not should be, that's not should be a, a, an excuse. Saying that I'm a volunteer so I don't have to learn anything, well, then why do it? If you don't have the time to educate, to further educate, if you don't have time to learn, if you don't have time to, you know, do training, then why volunteer, you know? The second is there's no continuous game watch. Um, coaches are not game, watching any games and analyzing them. They're not looking at the uh, players playing the game, the technical el elements, the tactical elements. They're not looking at the um, uh, coaches that are coaching those games uh, and, and as far as their tactics and how they do things and whatnot, analyzing games and learn from them. Um, there's also no continuous coach watch. In other words, Coaches are not watching other coaches, and I don't care what skill level they are. You know, uh, you can pick up little nuggets from a coach that just uh, literally just started, you know, um, his coaching career, just got his first certification, his first, li first license. You can pick up a nugget just the same as you can pick up a nugget from a professional coach coaching, you know, uh, FC Barcelona or what have you. Uh, learning, you know, from other coaches, watching them, learning their good and their bad points, you know, picking up little tips that you may have not thought about. It's, it's a great way to become a better coach. But since none of these things are happening at the U.S. youth uh, uh, coaching level, I figure that, um, you know, that's a pretty good starting place to start and, and show you why, you know, these things lead into common mistakes. So um, the first thing that I see everywhere I go, um, and especially at the younger ages, okay, Every soccer field that you go on to, basically, you'll see teams just doing laps, okay? Nothing wrong with doing laps, but it's got to be done for the right reason. So this is a video, which I think that you might enjoy. Let's check it out. Just, a, you know, a volunteer coach, basically, just, you know, jogging around with uh, kids that they look like, oh, I don't know, uh, six to seven to eight, I don't think they're eight, six to seven year olds. Okay. So they're casual jogging. You know, I, I really don't know what the purpose is that you could say, well, they're just jogging just to loosen up and warm up their muscles. Okay. I can see that. Um, but there's really not much other purpose other than that. Now, everywhere you go in any particular training session at any particular moment, you will see the first thing that coaches do is, hey, give me, you know, four laps around the field. Hey, give me, you know, uh, 10 minutes worth of running or what have you. Don't get me wrong. There is a time and a place to run. But, you know, 
if we're just going to be doing laps, so if the training session basically is an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and a half, and you spend half hour just running, well, again, it's soccer. It's not cross country. It's not, you know, track. There is, there is, you know, uh, training, soccer specific training that should be done, not just running. Furthermore, when you are doing laps, your your heart rate basically beats the same the same tempo because your running tempo is the same. You're running at a same same pace, so your tempo, your heart is being trained to beat a certain way. Soccer is all about you know short, quick sprints, sprinting, coming to a dead uh, stop and then starting again and on and on and on. So the training should be equivalent to that. So instead of just doing endless laps, maybe we can concentrate on doing short, short sprints, changing directions, things that, you know, would benefit better in, in a game situation. Now, let me show you what the difference is between, you would just see, you know, the running of the laps that your average youth coach does. And I'm going to show you one of our teams and how they do it. So basically, uh, this is one of our U17 uh, teams. Uh, this is a video that we shot uh, you know, when we went outside in the spring, so it's kind of chill. You can see they got the hoods on. Um, and they are using this as a dynamic warm up. In other words, just, you know, running and, and also developing their um, their endurance because, like I said, they're, you know, this was like the first or second week of outdoors, outdoor training. So we used it as a warm up, but also to build their endurance. So what we did is we basically put a ball at their feet. In fact, you know, we use balls no matter what we do. If we're training, if we're doing hurdles, ladders, we're always incorporating balls no matter what we do. Not only are they building up their um, their uh, endurance, not only are they warming up, uh, they're also getting touches on the ball. So they're getting a lot of touches on the ball. And as we know, you know, players don't go home and, and touch the ball. So being able to get them to touch the ball as much as possible, in, in, in our opinion, it's a good thing. Furthermore, try to run without the ball and then try to run with the ball. It's always more challenging to be able to run with the ball. Uh, so having that aspect, you know, it, 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 it develops their touches of the ball. It, de it challenges them. Um, as, the, as the running progresses, you know, we're going to do – little sprints from the back. We're going to do quick sprints and stop. So we're going to, you know, build this, and incorporate all the little things that we said. Instead of just jogging around at the same pace, we're going to change up the pace. We're going to, you know, cut and go a different direction, all using the balls. Okay. So let's just take a quick look. And just, just, you know, again, they're, they're, you know, just starting to warm up. They're, eventually, this is going to be built up where the pace is going to accelerate. So they're going to be running faster. The last player is going to sprint to the, to the front and then, you know, go back to a jogging pace. So basically, they're going to accelerate to a sprinting pace. Then they're going to slow down to a jogging pace. Then they're going to cut and change directions with the ball. So all the things that we talked about, you know, your heart is going to be beating, you know, at a different different tempo all the time your body is going to go from real fast to real slow to a medium pace and so on and so forth which is more realistic for a soccer game than rather just you know doing laps okay now let's uh hear the opinion of uh one of the uh coaches that trained um some of our teams last year when we were in spain so basically every year we take um, teams to spain Portugal, you know, international tours in other, you know, countries in Europe. But last year, the um, this particular coach gave us an evaluation for um, one of our teams. But he also explained uh, the difference in the way uh, U.S. teams train in reference to Spanish teams or other European teams, as well as, um, you know, uh, countries or teams from countries around the world. So I'm just going to skip a little bit to this. I'm not going to go in, uh, uh, from the beginning. So bear with me for a second. Me, the um, I think they are good. They are good players, good attitude also. But uh, I think some differences between them and us on um, playing football is uh, that they must they must uh, face the coaching there. I think that they are uh, making good things there. And the difference between training there and here is um, the 
that they make two parts in some trainings, one with not ball and the other one with ball. Here in Spain we, we, we work always with the ball, okay, also the physical part. So I think that are the, the main difference between them and us in training. Thank you very much, coach. So as you guys, um, as you guys heard the coach uh, talk uh, about the, the, the one of the differences is that uh, he says that the U.S. teams basically separate the training into training with a ball and training without the ball, running, agility, and whatnot, where they incorporate basically the ball in every activity that they do. So if that's, you know, jogging, sprinting, going over hurdles, r ladders, they're always incorporating a, a, a ball. The players are always touching the ball with their feet where it becomes second nature. So their technical ability develops uh, at a much greater rate than than you know than here in the U.S. Don't forget, you know, in, in order for somebody to be an expert at something, they have to do something over ten thousand hours. Which, if you really sit down and do the math, um, your average uh, U.S. soccer player trains maybe an hour and twenty minutes per week times two or three. So that's about th three to five hours per week. And again, that's not you know fully training at an hour and twenty minutes. You probably uh, train, you know, maybe an hour, if, depending on the age, maybe even less at the younger ages, a lot less actually. So it would take, you know, a lot longer for, you know, a player to become an expert at, at doing a skill. So when, by the time they're, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, most of them are not going to be an expert. They're just going to be an okay player. So now let's let's also examine how their style, the Spanish style of play, uh, how they incorporate um, the ball, not in just to just running, but other activities as well. So here's, uh, you know, again, you know, uh, our team training in the same facility with the same coach. And now what they're doing is they're going to do an activity where they have different stations. So you'll see there's about five different stations, five different uh, players. And, and you'll see like this group here are going to be doing using some hurdles. These guys here are using a ladder. And as the video expands, you'll see on the side here, there's other players doing other things. And then the coach, you know, serves the ball into the field and it becomes a basically small-sided game. And at, in the goal, we have a goalkeeper. Therefore, incorporating the goalkeeper into our training sessions, which is another thing that, you know, a lot of youth coaches uh, are guilty of not including the goalkeeper into activities that involve field players. So you, you will see, again, the difference between uh, their style and ours. So let's just watch. So one station there, one station there, one station here, one station there. One, two, three, four, five stations. Now they're coming in. They get served the ball. The goalkeeper is in place. So now you got the goalkeeper working on positioning. And, of course, you know, all the other goalkeeping elements back again in the goal. Next group goes. Again, five stations. They do whatever they need to do. And the, the, the play is going to continue to a point where... Um, eventually there's going to be a shot taken. So that's a pretty big difference, like I said, you know, and, and I noticed that um, from the trainings that we did in Spain as well as other countries. And it's something minor, but it's something that, you know, we need to adapt here at the youth level and have coaches um, utilize the balls at the players' feet as much as possible. So... The next uh, mistake that we see a lot of goalkeeper, uh, a lot of coaches, uh, youth soccer coaches make is lines. They they are just endless lines, kids, you know, waiting to do an activity. Um, and when you have you know uh, lines, you're always having a distraction. You have you know players goofing off. They're bored. They start teasing each other. Uh, there's no engagement. They're not paying a, a, a attention to the activity, and on and on and on. So instead of doing that, maybe, you know, we can just learn to basically spill, split up the team in different stations. Once again here, you'll see there's a station here with one, two, three, four players. There's a station in the middle here with another four or five players. And there's a station all the way at the end here and a goalkeeper in the goal. So you have three stations or about four or five players apiece. Uh, they're all going to be doing individual activities. Um, the other, The two stations here... Uh, their activity involves passing and eventually going to be going to shooting in the goal. This um, station here involves of players basically passing the ball through the sticks, which indicates, uh, represents rather uh, defenders. Just learn how to move 
um, in in sequence and 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 as an organized unit. So these are all the tactical and technical skills that come into place. Instead of just doing lines and doing one thing, now we have all players working together, and of course the coach is supervising. So let's take a look at this. So you see the coaches are telling them what to do, explaining the, explaining the activity. And then, you know, all three stations are going to start touching the ball in this particular station, touching the passing back, working as a unit. Now everybody's working. So instead of having the coach serving balls, you have a player serving ball. So you have five players working out at their, at their skills of passing, controlling the ball, and moving. And then in the middle, of course, I guess, like, again, there's a different passing activity with a coach in the middle, you know, uh, directing the, the boys, telling them what to do, um, correcting anything that needs to be corrected, and then eventually a shot is taken at the goalkeeper. So, again, you know, just a simple way of eliminating lines, avoiding players goofing off, avoiding, the, you know, them being bored, um, and, of course, uh, increasing engagement into the, uh, into the activity. Okay? All right. So, next mistake that uh, we see quite a bit of is, is ranting. And this picture can probably, you know, give you guys a thousand words without really having to explain. You can see the coach ranting. You can see his demeanor, his body language. And I'm sure his verbiage is, is, is not the nicest. So ranting, by the way, includes language that is used. It's the manner the message is delivered as well as, you know, uh, how the kids are receiving that, that uh, message. Now, remember, kids do not like to be lectured. I, that's, that's number one. Lecturing uh, a player's effort in front of other players, listening can definitely have an effect. So if, if, if you're going to... If you're going to point out a player, let's make sure that, you know, that player is being given positive feedback. Excuse the telephone. Um, by, avoid, you know, by avoiding ranting at players, especially in between games, like, you know, the halftime or after game, after the games, it's, it's very important because players need some time to recover. They just got done playing 45 minutes of of you know high energy activities so they need time to decompose they need time to hydrate if they're going to have you know um, a snack an energy snack or what have you they need a couple of minutes to basically just you know clear their minds as opposed to having their coach jump all over them right away uh, on the next slide we're going to give you um, you know uh, an example this is one of our coaches for U17 team that's basically uh, addressing the teams and I want you guys to watch his mannerisms you know his tone of voice and his language uh, and then we'll, we'll um, you know, I'm not going to play the whole video. I'm just going to play a little sample. Uh, but, you know, we'll discuss uh, after you guys watch. Great play. You ran that one. The, you got the foul. You achieve what you're looking for. All right? Riley. You know, next time, just... Oh, I kicked the shit out of the ground. <laughs> oh, you, you kicked the ground? Oh, I had so much dirt right in my tongue. You see, don't go steam, man. You gotta be enough. Don't feel bad for those things, all right? Brando, you took over good job, really good. But listen, Chase, Chase, Marcus, you know that guy was tough, physical, but you step up. Step up. I like that. I like that. <laughs> okay, so as you notice, <coughs> excuse me, as you notice, his tone of voice is very calm. He's engaging. You know, the team in sort of a conversation, there, there are, you know, one of the players is telling him that he was, you know, he, you know, he was trying to take a, um, a, a set piece and um, he hit his uh, foot in the, in the ground. So he was engaged in conversation. He was uh, he was individually talking to players and pointing out the positive things that he, he thought that that they did. Um, and the whole tone is, you know, passing the message where the players are receptive and listening to what he has to say, as opposed to, you know, ranting and going crazy uh, at the way he delivers the um, the message. So, listen, guys, at the end of the day, you know, as, as the presentation started initially by saying, you know, be a student of the game, you know, watch other games, uh, study other coaches, and please, you know, and I say this all the time, coaches think who they are. 
You know, they got their Adidas suits and they think they're coaching a World Cup game. They are too good to learn from a coach that's just getting started, okay? And that's a, that's a wrong attitude. In, in Europe, in South America, whatever we go and we talk to coaches, you know, they don't see us as, well, you guys are just Americans and you don't know anything about football. They are happy and they're eager to pass the knowledge and share the knowledge that they have with us. And that's the right attitude. Don't look down on a coach that just started, you know, um, and may not have a lot to offer. You may be able to pick up a nugget, you know, from the way he does things or the way he, he, he you know, he shares things. Um you know, don't get me wrong. There are some, you know, coaches that are pretty new and they have, you know, the God syndrome or they're very arrogant or what have you. Those coaches, I'm assuming that there's not much, you know, you, you can learn from them other than, you know, try to say, hey, listen, um, you might want to think of da 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 da. But at the end of the day, guys, be a student of the game and share your knowledge with anybody who's interested in listening. Unfortunately, in the youth soccer community, as far as I'm concerned, there's way too many people that think they know what they're doing, but they're actually, you know, clueless. They really don't know anything about the game, and they're passing around a lot of mis, you know, misinformation. Uh, since the age of social media and since the age of the internet, everybody has an opinion, and everybody can project that opinion out there. It doesn't make that opinion correct. So you have to do a little due diligence, examine people's credentials, where they're coming from, what they have accomplished, what's their past, and then you can judge yourself if you should listen to that, you know, individual. Once again, guys, I hope you have a great spring season and I'll see you in the next video.